we want. For example, we want cheap, green, and abundantly available hydrogen peroxide. And the use is we want to use it in reducing life cycle CO2 and non CO2 emissions by using it as an oxidant in commercial process. And last but not the least, reducing the risk of standard asset. Like we continue using the fossil fuel, but we reform that, upgrade those fossil fuels using hydrogen peroxide, and that's how we extend the life of existing, uh, <coughs> existing assets. So this is the structure, and all these three uh, topics I'm going to cover in the, throughout my talk. But before that, I would like to share some information uh, from the latest IPCC report. Now what you are looking over here is uh, essentially a consolidated picture of global warming. Uh, so these are human activities. We have CO2, non-CO2 and others. Now this others is very important. These are called short-lived climate forces, SCLF. And these are the SOX, the NOx, the CO, the UHC, and so on and so forth. And non-CO2, we are very familiar. These are uh, the N2Os, the CH3, the halogenated gases, so on and so forth. So you are looking here the emissions uh, from now until 2100 for these and the concentrations thereof. And then you are also looking at five scenarios, SSP1, I'm going to talk about this, what is SSP1 and uh, all the way up to SSP5. And these scenarios tell us uh, uh, at the end of the 21st uh, century, uh, what would be the climate forcing, what would be their temperature. Essentially, we want to stay within 1.5 degree temperature rise, and so on and so forth. So, uh, looking here, the observed global warming until now is about 1.07 degree C. And we are left with only 0.43 degrees C uh, to, uh, as, as our temperature budget. And if you look over here, you would find that there is a positive radiative forcing, radiative forcing, and also the negative radiative forcing. Now, positive radiative forcing is primarily coming from greenhouse gases, while the negative green, uh, uh, radiative forces forcing is coming from primarily aerosols. <coughs> so. So essentially, what we want to do is not only uh, target CO2, but also uh, short-lived climate forces, because these are also important for air, air pollution and air quality. So what my point over here is, the air pollution mitigation and climate change mitigation should go hand in hand. Currently, it's not the case. Now let's look at the contribution of regions to global radiative forcing in 2015. Now what you are looking over here is OECD, essentially the developed countries, Asia, which includes India and China, and uh, these are other regions. I, I'll uh, just focus on uh, Middle East and Africa. So in this big circle includes uh, is the uh, radiative forcing, which is positive, and the hollow piece over here it's not negative. So as you can see here, uh, we have uh, tremendous amount of uh, cooling also going on along with warming. And this cooling is actually masking the impact of actual global warming. As you can see, for example, countries like India and China, uh, the total warming they produce, the cooling is essentially 60% of that. So 60% of warming is masked by cooling and this is primarily due to aerosols. So when these countries move forward and control their air, clean their air, the, uh, the, the requirements to reduce the greenhouse gases would be far more because they would not be masked anymore by aerosols. So this is an important point I want to make. In terms of Middle East and uh, Africa region, so you can see uh, SOX, NOx, I'm not sure whether it's, uh, the print is legible or not, but SOX, NOx, <coughs> primary aerosol, secondary aerosol, uh, and ozone as, the, uh, uh, as, as causing the negative uh, uh, radiative forcing. 
And another important aspect is the dust in this area. Uh, nobody can control it. Uh, but uh, this dust uh, comes from Sahara region and goes to Saudi Arabia and it interacts with air pollution and exacerbates that. So it increases the impact of air pollution and also leads to cooling. Uh, so we looked at the regional contribution, now we will look at the sectoral contribution. Now my talk will be focused on uh, uh, industry and shipping. So you can see uh, there is negative contribution coming primarily from socks and knobs. So another important thing, uh, IPCC what it does in nowadays is it clubs uh, these uh, climate forces into ozone precursors or particulate matter precursors. So what I have done is, and then it, uh, uh, it deduce the cooling and warming effect. What uh, we have done over here is, uh, we have also, uh, with all these uh, climate uh, active gases or aerosols, we have looked into the pollution aspects, for example, coal, oil, natural gas, and hydrogen ammonia, and look at the impact on these pollutants uh, for, uh, when, when the combustion happens. As we can see, hydrogen also has a significant emission propensity. The reason being, hydrogen large scale infrastructure is not really tested yet. And some experts believe that up to 20% leakage is possible because the molecule is so small. And hydrogen is also a very potent greenhouse gas. And it also uh, eats up the uh, OH radicals in the atmosphere, which actually are the same for methane. So the methane lifetime increases. So what I mean to say is, it's a complicated problem. It's not simply reducing the carbon dioxide or methane. It needs to be looked holistically, and that's where we will look at some solutions. Now, this is again, uh, uh, this, uh, these are well-known scenarios uh, uh, from policy sciences. SSP1 is the uh, scenario that is uh, we are called sh uh, shared socioeconomic pathways. This pathway is actually uh, the 1.5 degree C compatible pathway. After the Paris Agreement, uh, it was created because none of the other uh, 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 climate uh, pathways were, were able to reach the 1.5 degrees. And then representative concentration pathways are actually, they tell you the radiative forcing at the <coughs> end of the century and SSP 1.9 means 1.9 watt per meter square is your, uh, uh, the, the radiative forcing at the end. And it gives you the path, path also. So this path if we follow uh, SSP 1 scenario and RCP 1.9, we are safe. And uh, this is where, uh, now what I have done is, uh, I've gone to the IPCC Interactive uh, Atlas and uh, got this one point, uh, SSP 1, 1.9 scenario for Arabian Peninsula for this region. So now we have a boundary condition. This is how the CO2 should go down. And we, so we are already doing inventory of CO2 emissions. But what we are not doing is inventory of PM 2.5 and ozone. Now what I want to propose here is we do inventory for all these pollutants which contribute to PM 2.5 and ozone. And go back, which industries are polluting, which, uh, which uh, institutions uh, have the maximum, uh, 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 maximum amount of pollution from, of certain kind and then do not exceed this limit for entire uh, Saudi, uh, sorry, the Arabian Peninsula. And finally, connecting the dots. And this is a paper uh, I wrote with Professor Roberts. So there are a few steps that we have identified. The end goal is net zero plus air quality. It's not net zero alone. And ultimate aim is sustainability and health benefits. So we go here. We have Greenhouse gases, we have uh, hydrogen, we have SCLFs. These are our emission. Uh, these are our emissions. 
So we do the inventory of these. We, we want to know precisely from where they are coming, how much they are coming. And then we divide them into uh, essentially warming and cooling and GHG, PM and ozone. And then set emission trajectory uh, based on carbon budget and mitigation scenarios. For example, we can pick SSP 1, 1 1.9 and then do this uh, uh, set. And then uh, do the policy, for example, nationally determined contribution of greenhouse gases, circular carbon economy, air pollution uh, policy, all these should come in picture. And then we decide how much of share of hydrogen electricity efficiency and things like that should be there. And then build the infrastructure uh, after putting together sectoral technology roadmaps. Now when I come to uh, infrastructure, I just told you hydrogen can be a potential uh, greenhouse gas. So you go back and go back to the first step, <coughs> add those emissions which are possible. So this is what we have put together uh, to quantitatively handle this. Now what it will require, it will require a massive inventory exercise of uh, worldwide emissions of not only greenhouse gases but short-lived climate forces. Now with that, <coughs> Uh, I move on to the industry piece. Now, this is where we are if we want to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. The red dots suggest that we are not on target. So, the big industries like chemical, iron and steel, cement, pulp and paper, essentially not on target. Shipping, not on target. So, this is where we will focus uh, in this talk. And, uh, if we look at it, iron and steel is third in ranking in terms of global pollution. Cement is the fourth. So after China and United States, these industries pollute the maximum. And petrochemical industry is at number five. So what we want to do is to understand what kind of emissions these are. Basically, why we call them hard to abate emissions. The reason we call them hard to abate emissions is because they require high temperature heat. So you can see here, uh, up to about 50% of this heat is uh, high temperature. And you need to have fossil fuel to achieve those. And that's the reason uh, it's very hard to abate uh, uh, or electrify these, uh, these sectors. Now, they not only have fossil fuel emissions from combustion, but process emissions also. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to cover that also in, in a little bit, but uh, consider two pieces here that we want to reduce the emissions from fossil combustion as well as the process emissions. So, uh, Professor Daly has put together this uh, roadmap for heavy industry. Actually, he is working uh, with the uh, Ministry of Energy in Saudi Arabia to put together cement uh, industry decarbonization roadmap as we speak. So some of these options are direct electric, uh, electrification, solar thermal, hydrogen, ammonia, biofuels, and uh, the corresponding TRL level are over here. I'm not going to go into these details, this is just an eye chart, but what I'm going to talk about is how hydrogen peroxide and some of the programs that we have in cows are catered towards achieving this roadmap. Now CCRC has been uh, looking into developing fundamental knowledge and then translating it to industrial know-how. So I'm going to uh, discuss two technologies. Third technology is, uh, I'm not going to, I'm just going to mention that. One is uh, hydrogen peroxide based oxidative desulfurization, and the second <coughs> one is of, uh, hydrogen peroxide as oxidant in combustion, and cryogenic carbon capture. So what does it do? Well, the first technology desulfurizes heavy fuel oil, which is important fuel for marine industry, power industry, many of these heavy industries. It is with SOX, one can be compliant with the uh, International Maritime Organization's uh, IMO 2020 guidelines. Uh, what does hydrogen peroxide do? I just told you, it produces nitrogen free exhaust, easy and efficient carbon capture, small volume, easy transport, easy storage or sequestration. Also reduction of pollutant. Cryogenic carbon capture is perhaps one of the only technologies that not only captures carbon, but allows you to uh, capture SOX, NOX, and PM, mercury, etc. So this is a technology 
which uh, Professor Robert uh, has led in development for last four or five years, both these, uh, the oxidative desulfurization and uh, triple C. And uh, we have uh, achieved uh, significant success. We are currently at TRL 7. We are uh, demonstrating this at large scale at customer size, uh, sites, uh, the ODS technology as well as the, uh, this uh, uh, carbon, cryogenic carbon cap capture. Currently 30 tons per day uh, MOU have just been signed. Now the middle one is uh, where my talk will be focused because it is still a low TRL. As I just said, it's Professor Daly's idea to, to, uh, to, to explore hydrogen peroxide as an as a oxidant. And uh, major challenges, uh, I've listed, uh, I, I've listed here hydrocarbon recovery for OTS, support management. I'm not going to go, go into those details, but I'm going to go in details about green production of hydrogen peroxide, burner and combustion modifications. Cryogenic carbon capture, we are overcoming this hurdle. As I just said, we, we, have, uh, we are building this uh, for uh, Saudi electricity company, 30 tons per day as we speak. Uh, and the uses thereof. Now, this is again an eye chart. What I want to show over here is different fuels and different emissions and uh, high potential for cleaning those emissions is green and very low potential is red. Now, when we look at uh, um, uh, heavy fuel oil with ODS plus hydrogen peroxide plus triple C, it essentially checks all the boxes, but the cost is high. Natural gas with hydrogen peroxide and triple C also checks all the boxes, but this is high. So this is where our focus is. But as I said, these two of these technologies are fairly mature at 70 RL, but hydrogen peroxide is not yet, uh, so it's more in the exploration phase. I just want to highlight that. Okay, now, Summarize synchronize circular carbon economy with air pollution control policy. Currently, it's not. We only talk about circular carbon economy, and it's simply not enough. We need to have inventory of short lived climate forces. We need to create roadmap based on alternatives potential to mitigate both greenhouse gases and SCLF emissions. And we look forward to. Uh, Integrated solution, I just showed you three technologies put together giving you a certain option. And our aim is to keep using existing energy infrastructure and reduce uh, standard assets. For hard to abate uh, sectors, process emissions are very important. And this is again I will focus. So now I go back to this chart and start talking about first two items. The production piece. Now, I'm going, not going to spend too much time here. I just want to flash that hydrogen peroxide is a safe, uh, safe chemical. It can be used as a reducing agent, oxidizing agent. It de decomposes as oxygen and water. And it could be cleanest and most versatile chemical reagent. However, it has a penalty. It's not really produced uh, uh, cleanly today. Uh, so, as you can see, it has 47% uh, active oxygen content, which is quite high actually. If you think about ammonia as uh, hydrogen carrier, it only has 17% content. Now what it does is, at 450 degrees C, it decomposes to produce water and oxygen. And this is the main draw. It has been used at flame oxidizers because what it does, it increases the active radicals, OH, HO2, SCO, so on and so forth in the flame. Extension limits are enhanced, flame speeds increases, all those things happen. And currently, uh, we produce about 5.5 million uh, tons of, uh, of, of hydrogen peroxide. Cost is somewhere between 500 to 200 uh, per ton. And uh, it, it, all of these uses are very well known uses. I'm not going to go over there. Uh, but uh, I want to focus on how we produce this. There is a process called anthropoenone process. 95% of global hydrogen production comes this way. There are other processes like oxidation of alcohol, direct synthesis, so on and so forth. And uh, bio-inspired plasma treatment. But what we think 
could be potential uh, game changer against electrochemical uh, or photoelectrochemical synthesis. <coughs> uh, so, uh, anthroquinone process is a three step process, uh, uses uh, this chemical anthroquinone, and as you can see, there is O attached here. When it reacts with hydrogen, the OH comes from, uh, over here and then it reacts with oxygen and it releases uh, hydrogen dioxide. Some of it is, is consumed. This process is not very efficient. One of the reasons is hydrogen is gray hydrogen produced from fossil fuels and it uses expensive uh, palladium catalysts. A lot of uh, difficulties with this, but this is what we have. It has extremely high carbon intensity, 0.534 kg per uh, kg CO2 per kg of hydrogen dioxide. Now our idea is to valorize O2 from green hydrogen production. Now why we say that? This is a chart created by uh, this uh, one of the book I am uh, co-editor, my uh, colleagues Brown and Shabana uh, of Hydrogen Economy and Saudi Arabia has produced this chart. So what you are looking at in 2050, we are looking at somewhere between 560 million tons of 560 million tons, 530 million tons of hydrogen being produced. If you think about it, 600 million tons of hydrogen is equivalent to uh, 5,280 million tons of uh, oxygen, which could potentially turn into 10,200 million tons of hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide per annum, but if we are able to do that. So what we want to do is uh, utilize O2 as byproduct that is vented to atmosphere. Now I want to emphasize on this that venting is not an option. One cannot vent out excessive amount of oxygen in the atmosphere because it will, uh, it will have an oxidative environment in the surrounding. It will increase corrosion. There would be a lot of issues with it including effect on life. So this is not an option. We got to have some use of this hydrogen, uh, the oxygen. So now we propose is renewable energy to convert oxygen to hydrogen peroxide and let it act as oxygen carrier as well as uh, renewable energy carrier. And some of these uh, processes like steam engine reforming, autothermal reforming need oxygen as well as steam. So hydrogen peroxide in one go can be your one stop shop for your uh, reforming. And, uh, so this is uh, again just an eye chart. You take your uh, renewable energy, oxygen, renewable energy, and water, and uh, do the electrolysis, and then the distillation, the distribution, and end use. So the, uh, the, the exact process is called oxygen reduction reaction and water oxidation reaction. I'm not going to go in those details. And uh, this is the overall reaction. But uh, what I want to uh, show is that, uh, that what are the current issues with this? Now, the issues currently are developing selective catalyst as well as membrane. And um, overall improving the yield and pro uh, uh, process efficiency of this. And uh, so, as I said, this is currently chemistry limited. Again, a comparison between oxygen and hydrogen carrier, 47% uh, <coughs> oxygen uh, is uh, carried by hydrogen peroxide vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ammonia, which is 17.6%. Seven, uh, Other important thing is it's liquid at room temperature. Liquefying hydrogen, uh, oxygen takes uh, minus 183 degrees Celsius. Shipping of Hydrogen, oxygen, or ammonia in their liquid states need highly energy intensive pressurization and thermal insulation, but no such requirement for shipping hydrogen peroxide. And it has established production and distribution infrastructure just like ammonia. Now, we did some techno-economic study for about 3,000 tons per day of uh, production uh, of uh, H2O2. Uh, with the concentration 30%. <coughs> and uh, these are some numbers. I just want to convey the message. Half of the cost is coming from electrolyzers and uh, its uh, installation, and rest is the construction. 
and in the OPEX, most of the cost is labor, and it's very flexible. Depends upon country to country. Now, as you can see, we we feel that we can achieve 578 per ton of E H2O2 solution with delivery 2,000 kilometers away using shipping. An anthropinone process is uh, 500 to 1,200 per ton of H2O2, excluding the transport cost. Now, what what we did was uh, we did this study where we compared liquid oxygen, uh, EH2O2, and chemically synthesized, which is uh, the regular production of hydrogen peroxide. There is not uh, much to choose, but the green uh, production and transportation offers uh, quite a lot of uh, advantage. Now, another important thing to note is uh, we are transporting oxygen as oxygen. Here we are transporting oxygen with water. So the quantity that is being shipped is uh, quite, quite a lot. It's about 10 times high. So there is some carbon penalty. This is carbon penalty here. So comparatively, there is carbon penalty for transporting uh, 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 e hydrogen peroxide. So now, what we did was, uh, on our northwest coast, we have Neom, which is the green hydrogen plant. And on the west coast, we have several SMRs. So we thought, why don't we use this opportunity to see what cost it is uh, if we transfer by uh, land route or sea route. And as you can see, scenario one is, uh, we make hydrogen peroxide plant in Damam and use it in the mom. So both, so we are shipping the oxygen here. And in this case, we are uh, sending the H2O2. So we are making the, the e, uh, e, uh, H2O2 right here in, uh, in Neom and sending it out. And the costs are not too different. Uh, but uh, if we uh, make chemically uh, this, uh, and use it, uh, then uh, it's uh, the maximum cost. So cost-wise, it makes sense. So, so what what is the bottleneck? The bottleneck is is uh, the the e, uh, e production does not exist today. Okay. So if it does not exist, should we stop uh, working towards it? Absolutely not. So while our friends in catalysis and membranes develop the e production process, we are developing uh, the the combustion and the fuel upgrading processes. And this is where I'm going to highlight some of the ongoing research work of Professor Delhi uh, that he is doing. So you saw Zhao Jin's uh, presentation uh, uh, two days ago. So what we have done, we have done some counter flame uh, diffusion, uh, counter flow diffusion flames, uh, and uh, achieved uh, uh, stabilized Hydrogen peroxide on your right, on your left, water and oxygen flame. Now when hydrogen peroxide breaks, it breaks into water and oxygen, but it also releases energy. So the adiabatic temperatures are higher. So their luminosity is primarily coming from, uh, 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 from, from water, we believe. So this is very fresh out of the press uh, uh, result which we are showing. And most of these results are uh, work in progress that I'm going to flash here. But we have successfully achieved establishing uh, the counterflow uh, flame with H2O2X oxidizer. It's the main point. Extinction results, uh, my friend Zhao Jin showed. So we uh, used uh, hydrogen and nitrogen as fuel and used water and oxygen as the oxidizer and determined the extinction strain rates. The extinction limits are increased. However, the important piece over here is none of the kinetic mechanism was able to predict that. So what we believe is that the flame become more resistant to extinction at higher fuel and O2 concentration, but state of the kinetic, uh, state of the art kinetic models are currently not adequate to handle those. Now, after uh, laminar, we move on to the turbulent swirling inverse diffusion flame. I'm sure uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Ayman, will uh, present on this, uh, uh, on this, uh, but uh, with, with a different fuel. But 
we are using uh, Dr. Ayman and uh, Professor Roberts uh, this burner, turbulent uh, inverse uh, diffusion flame burner. And we don't have any results yet, but what we have done, we have modeled this. And again, the modeling results are also fresh out of the press. So we have this flame. Uh, uh, Dr. Ayman determined the stability limit with Matlin. So we have this FS2 flame. So what we are doing, we are picking this flame for uh, baselining our work. And uh, these are C uh, CMD model uh, details. We are using 3D convert, detailed kinetics uh, model uh, using GRI Mac currently. And these flames are difficult with SWIRL <coughs> model. And we also face some difficulties. Now, uh, this was repeating what Dr. Hyman did. And we found our current modeling approach is uh, reasonably enough. Uh, so we uh, went forward and used this configuration to model uh, the uh, hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 flame. Now, until uh, last week, uh, these are two cases, one with uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, water as 0.3 and oxygen as 0.7 and in the other one water is 0.6 and oxygen is 0.4. We couldn't establish uh, hydrogen peroxide flame. Uh, there was a lot of flashback so we are not showing those results. But uh, we got uh, some preliminary results that we are showing. The first one has high oxygen content. The second case has low oxygen content. You could see that the second case is a getting points due to water content. Whether the flame in the first one is, uh, is still holding on. These are very initial results, so I won't comment beyond that. The point I'm trying to uh, make over here is we have started working towards establishing a program of uh, uh, where multiple activities are going on in this field to explore fundamental as well as IDRL level research. This is one work that Professor Daly did, and this is where uh, process emissions come into picture. This uh, limestone calcination is one of the main processes of cement, which is done at uh, 800 to 900 degrees C. This process alone accounts for 4% of global CO2 emissions. And the CO2 actually comes from the process itself, not the combustion piece. 65% is process, uh, process emissions. So no matter whether you use electrification, <coughs> no matter whether you use electrification or combustion, you will encounter uh, these uh, emissions. <coughs> you, you cannot control. And that's why carbon capture is the only option that is ne needed. And this is the process that uh, Professor Daly has developed with his colleagues, where we take hydrogen peroxide, and this is the E option here, but I'm talking about this. And uh, this hydrogen peroxide, without any nitrogen, this oxidizes the uh, uh, fuel, and it goes, uh, goes, does the calcining. The exhaust of the calciner does not have any nitrogen. Water can be condensed out, and CO2 can be easily sequestered. Uh, I'll skip some of these charts and uh, one of the important pieces is we are able to achieve the uh, adiabatic flame temperature that is uh, achieved with the combustion of uh, uh, methane with air. And again we are modeling on this. Some of the Aspen results uh, we are showing. Main challenge currently is on your left y axis. The, this is uh, the production of hydrogen peroxide uh, without any uh, renewables on your right with renewables. So, and uh, the x axis is the amount of hydrogen peroxide in, in the oxidizer. So, as you can see, the captured carbon actually increases a lot when we, uh, when we use. Uh, uh, when we could use the renewable uh, hydrogen peroxide. However, today, uh, this is not the case because hydrogen peroxide has a uh, major penalty. So again, I won't go into these details. Uh, we are able to establish 
thermodynamically realistic process, similar energetic efficiency with modest changes. Net CO2 emissions are also reduced and similar adiabatic flame temperature can be achieved. And in summary, uh, the high cost of CO2 capture due to need for separation of diluted CO2 from N2 in exhaust. And we are able to overcome this because nitrogen free <coughs> exhaust, exhaust is possible. The preliminary assessment suggests that we need to work on reaction kinetics, heat <coughs> transfer, flow regimes, system material compatibility, and techno-economics to really make uh, uh, to really explore uh, the uh, calcination building hydrothermal side. Absence of uh, N2 also reduces uh, NOx, which is uh, which is currently a major challenge. But as of today, H2O2 is not very well established, and there is scientific knowledge which is lacking. And hence, and it's excessive research is needed in securing fundamental data and building credible kinetic and CFD model. And with that, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, the paper is now open for discussion. Any questions? Yes, sir. Thanks for the interesting talk. Um, so you talked a lot about cost, but you didn't talk about energetic efficiency. Can you say something about um, energetic efficiency? You know, in the, I mean, starting from the renewable electricity. Uh, currently, it's uh, not efficient. Uh, I have uh, one chart here. If you can see, uh, we are achieving uh, the first law efficiency of 45 percent with maintenance fuel and. 46.7% uh, as uh, as coal as fuel. C is carbon is a substitute or surrogate for coal. So we are efficiency wise, we are uh, right in the ballpark. Similar energetic efficiencies, but the main challenge over here is if you look at the very first row, uh, this is fraction of CO2 avoided by using. CH4 and C. Now we would expect, since we are not using uh, uh, air uh, and uh, our processes are efficient, that we would we would avoid some part of the CO2. But since hydrogen peroxide production entails lot of CO2, that's why it is negative over there. <coughs> but captured part is 67 percent in case of methane and 72% in case of uh, carbon uh, or coal. Now coal produces more, uh, so we are capturing more. So it's not like this is uh, less efficient, methane is less efficient. So yeah, we have looked into this. These are all published results and uh, uh, also a patent has also been filed on this. So, so does this include the distillation? I, I assume the distillation, uh, that's, a, that's a 
energetically the, the hydrogen or do you use the hydrogen peroxide water solution? So in e-production, uh, we may not need distillation because the concentration is function of uh, electrolysis process like the current, density, the uh, potential difference, so on and so forth. So uh, in the chemically produced H2O2, you need distillation because there are impurities and concentration the way you want. So I think that by playing with the electrolysis parameters, we can get rid the, of the need for distillation. concentration is uh, very safe, can be easily used, but uh, uh, there is a group in Korea, Professor Lin, I have his reference, he has used up to 50% uh, in coal combustion. So he published this work in 2017, some of the early works where he used uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide for coal as an oxidant in the coal combustion process. So there he used up to uh, 50%. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a concern, but you may not need that much. So the point is, all these things are there, just like they were there a few years ago for ammonia. But now we consider ammonia as a viable option. So currently what the, 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 the proposal we are presenting uh, to the commercial community is, consider this as an oxygen career and start evaluating it do some fundamental work, generate knowledge, and find out whether it really works or not. We believe it can work. So did, did you vaporize in the country? Yes, vaporization is the right thing to do. So pre-vaporize it and then use it. Okay, so last question, Gitano. Oh, go ahead. Last question. So, but uh, for in the aerospace industry, hydrogen peroxide has been used as an oxidizer for propellant. And normally, from what I recall, regularly, is you use a, a catalyst to decompose the uh, hydrogen peroxide. Why you yes. guys are pre vaporizing with the catalyst that be much easier? So, in the rocket, uh, as a rocket propellant, what happens is the concentration is extremely high, up to 90%. So, what they do is they, they decompose it. Uh, by using a catalyst and the product is a steam at about 6-700 degrees Celsius which uh, they use uh, um, as, as, as a thrust uh, agent. So it's, it's different over there and it is monopropellant. Yeah, they use it also for I, I'm very sure they use it. So I told you one example and perhaps they use it for oxidizer also but the concentrations are extremely high. For combustion purposes, we don't. Okay, that's probably a good uh, note on which to close. So please join with me again in thanking uh, Dr. Sassi. <laughs> and now we'll continue with the rest of the uh, contributed uh, papers. So uh, we'll just uh, uh, hold for a minute for transition, but uh, the